to upgrade the museum. My goal is to, ra to raise a million dollars for this place to do some things in here, as well as to get a touch. We like to have a, um, a computerized um, historical element so that you can come and touch Arawak, you can touch explorers, and that history would come up. So help us to come into the 21st century, and we know you, that you will do that. As I say, we, we're having a raffle um, in June. We're gonna be having a raffle. We were hoping to have it in May, but we're gonna do it in June. We're still collecting prizes. We've had a very busy month because four of our volunteers are out sick. Three of them have had operations, surgery. Um, Jim is still convalescing. And then um, another person had to have prostate cancer treatment. So again, we've been very short. And two are traveling. <laughs> so we need some more volunteers as well. So if anybody feels that they can give a half day or a full day, please let us know. We do need some volunteers. The volunteers really keep this place open. Seven, five days a week, Monday to Friday, 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. And they do a fantastic job. Please give all of our volunteers a round of applause, really. They keep this place open. Um, we have a young, another young man, Robert, who's he's a gem and a, a, a really great IT person. But he got a job too. <laughs> he's young. But again, he's very helpful. He's been coming in on a Sunday. We're not advertising it yet because we don't know when it's going to stop. But if you're in the area and you see the door open on a Sunday, come in. Robert is here, okay? And then we have another person who comes in on Sunday afternoon after church. So we, we're here on Sunday, especially for the Bahamians, because we know most of them cannot come during the week. And thank goodness for all the tourists who are looking for Fort Bend Castle, <laughs> they find us on the way. But we have been lobbying for the, the uh, Ministry of Works to please put our street sign back. There's no street sign on Bay Street or Shirley Street that says you're on Elizabeth Avenue. And many times the, the, the tourists will come in and say, are we on Elizabeth Avenue? Okay, so we really need those signs up. We need pedestrian crossings. If you know anybody, you can put some pressure on to do that for us right up in this area. There's so many near miss accidents with Bahamians and tourists trying to cross the street because there's no like pedestrian crossing and the light doesn't wait. So thank you very much for your um, patience, and if you can assist us with any of those things I'm talking about, please do so. All right, let's have a word of prayer and we'll begin. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks and praise, praise for your many blessings. Lord, we thank you for this August body here tonight. We thank you for the young people in uniform. We love to teach them the history. And Father, you know the plans that we have for this place. You know the plans that you've put before us. And you've already brought us to this point since 1959. And we know that you will not allow us to fail. And so continue to open the windows of heaven and send along people who will assist us. We just thank you again and praise you for your many blessings throughout these years. In Jesus' name, amen. We have an excellent speaker this evening. Cordell came in here one day last month. Boy, and we hook him right up. <laughs> he came to have a look at some of our journals. He says he only likes to be in Nassau for one day, and then he's gone. <laughs> what? Okay, never mind that. But I've known him a very long time, a very professional person, and um, it's just wonderful to have him here tonight talking about the contract. And I won't steal his thunder. I will just introduce him. And this is what he's given me. He said, nothing too long. Just say, so welcome, Cordell. But anyhow, we're going further than that. So Mr. Cordell Thompson, educated at Government High School in Nassau, Bahamas. His journalistic career began at the Nassau Guardian under the tutelage of the late Eric Wilmot. Mr. Thompson went from the Nassau Guardian to um, Johnson S. Publishing Company in Chicago and ended his career there as New York editor for Jet and Ebony magazines. Mr. Thompson's articles covered all major social, cultural, and political events in the African-American um, commentary in the early 1970s. He put the beginning of the end the beginning of the end? Who's the beginning of the end? Wave. <laughs> That's my brother, Raphael Munnings. He put the beginning of the end in the jet um, picture of the week in 1972. Mr. Thompson returned home in 1976 to join the Ministry of Tourism and during his tenure served on the marketing teams that um, created the long-lived It's Better in the Bahamas campaign. Please let's welcome Mr. Cordell Thompson. Thank you. 
<laughs> yes, sir. Thank you very much, Andrea. Andrea and I go way back. My dad and I were best friends. I never paid to go in the cat and fiddle. Uh, I used to go through it oddly, though not with FM. <laughs> and, uh, and Sabo the Great. He to let me in free. <laughs> Wonderful experience. Uh, I'm very happy to be here tonight uh, to talk about the contract. My favorite episode in Bahamian history because I didn't live the contract, but I lived the contract through other people. I will tell you their story uh, in a minute. The contract, as you know, was an, a part of an agreement between uh, uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt and Winston Churchill. As you know, in the early years of 1940, 1941, Britain was getting the worst of the Nazi war machine. Uh, Churchill and Roosevelt signed a secret contract that called for land lease, and it's called a land lease program that gave America land in the Caribbean, in the Bahamas, Bermuda, from Bermuda down to Trinidad, which later became very important to the entire uh, our war effort. Uh, next. Sorry. Uh, important the fact that uh, after 19, after America joined the war in 1941 and became an enemy of Germany, there was a tremendous amount of U-boat, German, and Italian submarine uh, activity in this part of the world. Uh, so the bases in the Bahamas that came out of the land lease program were very important to the war effort, especially in Nassau and in Georgetown, Exuma. Now, my mom descends from Georgetown. My father was born in Rocus Point, Exuma. My father worked on the base in uh, uh, Georgetown. I see it all the time. Uh, and in fact, uh, in this, in this, in this, art, in this uh, edition of the journal, there's a very uh, interesting article about the U-boat activity in this part of the world. It's a very, it wasn't well known to the average Bahamian because it happened out to sea. There was a lot of war secrecy, but uh, uh, the people who still remember in Exuma said that they remember working on the base, and they remember that the base in Exuma, what, the base really was an amphibian base, not a, uh, a, a base where you land planes. But what happened was that Britain and America arranged for these amphibian planes to go out in the Atlantic in an arc to cover from Newfoundland down to, uh, to Trinidad, and they were deadly. I mean, they saw a submarine that was dead. Now, mind you, subs were deadly too. And this article talks about the number of persons who were killed through German submarine and Italian. Ital Italy was an axis of, was an ally of, of uh, Germany. So there was a lot of uh, activity in this part of the world. And those land lease, the land lease program had a lot of benefits. Uh, it, it was like Ch Churchill and Roosevelt were almost prophetic in terms of the way the bases in the Bahamas and the Caribbean protected the southeastern flank of, uh, of uh, the southeast of, of America. Cordell Hull, that's not my name. But Cordell Hull, I'm named after him. He was uh, Roosevelt's Secretary of State, brilliant man. Cordell Hull and, and Roosevelt had a relationship like Obama and uh, Hillary, okay? Cordell Hull was smarter than Roosevelt, Mr. Malis. He really was. Uh, he should have been president. But he was from Tennessee, and there was no way the northern politicians were going to allow a southerner to be president in 1939. So uh, my father, who worked on a base, I was born in 1944, thank you very much. So uh, I am named Cordell Salithiel Thompson. That's my part in history. Now, part of the land lease program allowed Bahamians to work in America as farm workers throughout, throughout America. Now, we're going to talk later on about whether this was good or bad, the benefits, the not so the, the setbacks, but uh, Uncle, no, not yet, <laughs> but uh, the, the land lease program opened a way for thousands of Bahamians to go to America to work on farms. Now, remember, this is America in wartime. Nearly every able bodied American male, women, were working in factories, and the men were on the war front. So there was a major labor shortage in North America, and 10,000 Bahamians filled that capacity over a period from 1943 
in 1966. It ebbed and flowed, but there were, it is estimated, and the archives has all the numbers in terms of how many of us went, how many of our families went over from that period of time to 1966. In 1956, I was my second year at Government High, and my favorite person in the whole wide world was a man called Uncle Bertie. Okay? He was uh, my favorite, favorite, favorite uncle. Uh, and he was a riot. Okay, but Uncle Bertie, sorry, Uncle Bertie uh, was simply typical of all the young men and women who went on a contract. Uh, Uncle Bertie couldn't read or write. <laughs> okay, Uncle Bertie was the son of a loyalist from Exuma, fairly light skinned, but he couldn't read and write. I mean, and he, it was unusual for him not to read and write because uh, he spent his time on a boat between Andrews and Nassau, so he didn't really attend school regularly. But he, was, he came back from the contract, I'm first year in government high, and I became his scribe. Now, kids, remember now, I'm your age now, in 1954, 55, 56, Uncle Bertie and all his compatriots came back from the States, couldn't read or write, so I had a job, hi Robert, <laughs> as a scribe, okay, I had to write Uncle Bertie's letter back to the States. Now, in my discussion today, I'm not talking about facts and figures and history. This is social history in our case, okay? I'm talking about Uncle Bertie and a whole host of men like him who came back home and imprinted on me. They were my heroes. And uh, I mean, he was just unusual. Uh, I remember one day, uh, after he'd been home about six months, I had to write his letters. So I used to go to the post office in Grantstown get his letters, because Uncle Bertie couldn't read his name as big as his house. Okay, so I used to go to the post office and say, do you have a letter for Bertie Smith and uh, Collins and about five men who were all part of his little group in the States. And I would have to read his letter, translate the letter, and answer the letter. I got a nickel or tuppence, a Belbo, a Belbo, Belbo tuppence. One day Uncle Bertie said to me, well, I put pen to paper. You all understand that? Put pen to paper. He said, take a letter. <laughs> and I, he said, write this to so-and-so up in Pahokee, Florida. I'm writing, he said. Then he said, oh, my dear, since I've been home, I work in my, grump, my father on the hobby horse track, and we have a carriage. And all day long, I'm going, <laughs> I saw Uncle Buddha, I can't spell. He said, he said, that's a word. I said, no, Uncle Brady, that's a sound. He said, that's a word. He said, you mean your mom's telling you the governor, you can't spell <laughs> it. Was, I mean, he, he's a riot, okay? So, um, Uncle, I, and I laughed. So he said, boy, don't laugh at me. And he got really serious, you know. He said, don't laugh at me. I said, why? I'm a little educated young man. Got more, I, I know I got more sense than him now, okay? <laughs> So he said, don't laugh at me. I said, why? He said, I travel. Pull up his full, his full five foot seven high. He said, I travel, boy. He said, I've been to the land of the free and the home of the brave. He said, the only country God blessed. He said, God bless America. And you know, that, that was their mantra. They believed that. I mean, here you are, illiterate men going to America, seeing money for the first time. And we're going to talk about that. Uh, later in terms of what they did, what they, how they benefited. But Uncle Brady said, you can't spell, I, I can't even do it. <laughs> okay, but again, uh, he was typical of the many thousands of young men who came from Acklands, Crooked Island, Exuma, uh, Cat Island, and they were recruited to go to America. Now, the sign said the project or the contract. There were two words for it. Uh, the contract was when you went abroad. The project was when you worked in Nassau, either at Windsor Field or at one of the bases, or worked for the American system. There were two bases at what is now in Linden Pilling International Airways was Windsor Field, named after the Duke of Windsor. We're going to talk about him. There's a slide on him to what? <laughs> Coming up. Uh, in that, the base of Windsor Field was a training base. Oaksville Airport that was built by Harry Oaks was also, was, well, sorry, let me get this right. Well, that was a training base. The base of Windsor Field was longer, and that supplied most of the war effort in North Africa. There was a whole lot of 
Uh, stick a pin, please. I'm going to have some questions, Q&As afterward. Somebody remind me to mention Jane Tooth. I got a lot of characters to deal with <laughs> tonight. But Uncle Brady, uh, if you worked on the base, you were fairly a little more literate than Uncle Brady. If you could only pick beans and pick okra or, or tomatoes in Florida, you and Uncle Brady and a lot of guys from Cat Island went abroad. The recruiting process, we'll talk about that in a minute, but uh, about 1983, we did a 50th anniversary of the contract, and I uh, worked with Tracy Thompson from COB and some others, and, the, and in fact, uh, the uh, post office did a commemorative stamp. I'll pass it around in a second. You want to see it, Mr. Millis? I had over, uh, I met a man named James Moss, who was president of the, Mr. Stubbs, good afternoon. Your contract? Are you a contract former, contract worker? Yes. You could correct me. I also see my uh, cousin, my, one of my, my cousin, my niece, and Ernestine Cox. And we're gonna talk about E Street, later on this piece, and I want, please, I would be corrected if I, Go on this, okay? Please, sir, okay? Anyone know Mr. Sam Stubbs? We all know him? Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, Mr. Stubbs is, uh, <laughs> Mr. Stubbs is, uh, okay. Uh, right, but, I'm getting ahead of myself, but ladies and gentlemen, this man was one of my heroes as a kid. You didn't see Randall Fox unless you saw him. Yeah. He, was the, he was the trumpeter, he was the clarion. No meeting started without a sound from him. And I was looking at the tape month, uh, a couple of weeks ago, Mr. Stubbs, and I saw you, I saw myself, I was on the march. My mother woke, got up at eight o'clock and looking for me to wake up to go on the march. I was already out there with my banner. And uh, 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 I, I was on Facebook talking about the march, and I recognized uh, the drummer, Dynamite, the watchmaker. Yes. What was his full name, sir? Who? Dynamite, on East Street, the watchmaker. Yes. That's what you call I don't know his right name yet. <laughs> okay, but uh, 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 then I, the, the music behind the tape that was put together by Rosalie Fox uh, was incredible. And I said, that's Bola Roberts' band. Let's see. How many, how many here would remember all that? Ray would yeah. remember, okay, Bella Roberts band. But all, of it. Uh, all, all of it? But uh, Mrs. Mrs. Stubbs, thank you for coming, and there's gonna be a question and answer period after this, I hope, so you can correct me if I, and where's Ernestine? Ernestine, I'm gonna mention the Coxes and the Collies and the Mosses and the Delavos in a minute, okay? Sorry. Uh, but during, uh, in, uh, uh, when we did the, the 50th anniversary, I met, Several people from North America. I'm from Florida, New York. You can hear me now? Can you hear me now? Okay. Uh, and Mr. Mr. Moss, who was then the, the president of the Bahamian American Federation in Florida, wrote an article for me, and I'll read you some of it, okay? He says, uh, remember, now the contract, the war, in fact, the economists said the war brought America out of depression. So if America was in depression, you imagine what it was for us. Okay, we were, we were hard times. Okay, Mr. Moss said, I remember in 1935, when I was at the age of eight, my grandmother walking with a stick to the depot for two quarts of red grits and a couple of pounds of flour, which is her allowance from the governor, the government, like old age pension at that time. He said, I am reminded of Sir Harry Oaks, the soft-hearted, I'm reading his actual letter to me, of the soft-hearted millionaire who at times hired people to work when actually there was no meaningful work to be done. So Harry Oaks would hire a number of people for a couple of days and say to them, pick up sticks and then drive off. All this happened when he was building Oaks Airfield. At four o'clock in the morning, you would find many people at Oaks building, Oaks Airfield site waiting for Sir Harry knowing within themselves that there was only a slight possibility that Sahari would hire any number of them. Those days were tough. This is, this is a, he, this, she's writing about a time when he was 16. I remind, I am reminded of Renegren and his ship, the Southern Cross. He had work going on on Hong Island, better known as Paradise Island. 
Uh, I'll, I'll digress from here. And Mr. Melis would agree with me. Axel Wenigren was a Swedish industrialist, munitions maker, who had who owned all of Paradise Island before the A&P uh, here, Harding and Hartford. The rumor was, well, it wasn't a rumor, he was a Nazi sympathizer, as was allegedly the Duke. Uh, so Axel was also involved in, not money laundering at the time, but money transaction. He had, he would make money on money. German marks, French uh, francs, Dutch marks, French francs, South American currency. In fact, he was uh, deported to Mexico where he died. And if you ever, if, if you can't see it now, but up until the 80s before Club Med, there were these two big burrums, right, Mr. Melis, at the northern end of Carlos Island, where they say, I wasn't there, they say that German submarines would come in there and refuel and re supply right here in Nassau. I wasn't there. It's a ledge rumor. <laughs> okay. But, uh, but he was, he hired people. Uh, you know, if you, the, maybe you're all too young to remember where Club Cafe Martinique was, there was a big lagoon that you can turn around a, a ship in. So the rumor was that he would help supply submarines at night. I wasn't in Mr. Mailers, okay? Mr. Snubs? Well, let me finish Mr. Moss' story. Mr. Moss say, I can remember, he said, I can see his foreman as he comes near to Malcolm Park and anchored his boat at about eight to 10 feet from the shore. And I can remember hundreds of unemployed men gathered on the park, hoping that they would be able to get a chance for a few days work. Despite they were there from First Fowl Crow. Anyone know what First Fowl Crow is? Excuse me. You know what First Fowl Crow is? No, that's when the first foul crow, and the first rooster crow. First foul crow, second foul crow, third foul crow, fourth foul crow is like nine o'clock, and if you're still in bed, boy, you're gonna get no breakfast, okay? All right? My grandmother, who, she had this, and we'll talk more about the Geechee language in a little while too. This, this language came with the loyalists, the Geechee Gullah language. First foul crow, second foul crow. Anyone know what day clean is? And you know what day clean is? When you can see in front of you, that's day clean. And, uh, 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 you can see. Uh, uh, Mr. Melis, Mr. Melis is Greek. He knows uh, Homer. And Homer talked about when the sun first kissed the horizon. Oh, very poetic. The pink sun touched the ocean. There you go. Say it again, please. <laughs> Absolutely. There you go. That's day clean. <laughs> All right, so Mr. Moss goes on to say that they're all trying to at least get one day's work. It was so tough. In trying to get their names on the work list, I have seen men, because of the surge of the crowds, pushing into the bay, pieces of, pieces of Johnny cake that were intended for lunch floating on the surface of the water. Now, the teams were tough. Coincidentally, coincidentally, most of them who were pushing the water were able to get their names on the high list because of their proximity to the boat to the boat that the foreman came over in. The recruiter and his own compassion determined whether they worked that day. Right, Mr. Stubbs? It was rough, okay? Those were the times when the Ministry of Works would hire a number of laborers for two or three days, lay them off, and then hire a new set of laborers for another two or three days, and lay them off, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It was rough. The reason behind this was so that, so that the opportunity to earn a few shillings would spread around to more people. Following these hard times, Oaks Airfield and the surrounding area became a military base, as I mentioned before, for the U.S. and her allies. And with a satellite airfield at Windsor Field, and which is now the LPIA, and the Oaks Airfield, as we've mentioned before, owned by Sahari Oaks. Following the slowing down construction, I'm reading his notes again, uh, at Oaks Airfield and the Burma Road Satellite Airfield, the agreement between the U.S. government and the Bahamas government recruiting laborers to the United States was signed. Recruitment was done at the Knights of King George building on Blue Hill Road. Shadrach Collins. I'm gonna break him free from Mr. Moss' narrative to talk about Shadrach Collins. Now, where were they signed? You came from, if you wanted to go on the contract, you had to come to Nassau to be recruited or to sign up. And most of the signing was done at the Knights of King George Hall on Blue Hill Road. Where well, you gotta go this way now. <laughs> <laughs> they changed the road. When you come up, you know Stardust? Okay, there were two big buildings. 
nice looking George and I think it was a, 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 the San Salvador Elevating Society.